This is TechZine Talks on Tour, the podcast about enterprise technology that brings you IT insights and analyses from events all around the globe. We cover everything, everywhere. Visit techzine.eu for more information. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. This is Sander. I'm at uh, KubeCon Europe. Just briefly, so first impression. I mean, lots of lots to do about AI, obviously, at this uh, at this Cube. Yeah, I will have that. But, and just all the all the hype now. Yeah, just to, to get a little bit out of the way in this discussion. So, what what do you make of um, of all this, and on, on what's the impact of, of of AI on 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 Kubernetes or on containers or in cloud native development in general? I think the biggest impact that we're seeing when it comes to AI is usage. I mean, ultimately, more and more people are trying to work out how they're going to bring AI into their infrastructures. Um, AI is impacting, it's just another workload. Let's just let's be very blunt about it. Yeah. That's ultimately just another workload. It does. But it is a fundamentally different workload to, to sort of... Different right. parts of it, for sure. I mean, yeah. if we're starting to talk about running ML or large language models, yes, we've got to change the way we think about infrastructure. But from a developer's point of view... Once that infrastructure is up and running, and you know we're talking about inference engines or you know access to GPUs, once that's been solved, and yes, it fundamentally does change a lot of the networking infrastructure we need. Yeah. Once that's been solved from a developer's point of view, it's just another set of microservices applications running that talk to, hopefully if you've done it right, yeah. talk to an API that provides you access to the language model yeah. or those components. So, so all, the, all the hype or the buzz or whatever you want to call it nowadays, uh, at 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 a conference like this and all the others, uh, how 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 deserved is it? <laughs> I'm going to get myself into trouble here. No, Look, you don't have to. I mean, <laughs> no. The reality is, I, I think there's a lot of deserved hype. Um, what large language models have done is they've changed the way that humans can interact with machines. I mean, I, I keep saying, and I don't want to offend anybody, but it allows your grandmother to talk to the machine. Yeah. Um, and in a world where, frankly, Kubernetes is still highly complicated for many people, if we can simplify that by providing interfaces through large language models, that's great. Yeah. Um, but LLMs are not all AI is. No, I mean, and AI has been around for me way longer yeah. than, than, than LLMs have been. I was right? reading about a, a, a test case in the 1950s. You know, yeah. People don't think computers existed, but you know, hell, yeah. they did, and they were yeah. being used, and there was some amazing research work done. Yeah. But the reality is... What's most interesting about this for me is all the stuff that's coming up around the open source ecosystem. Yeah, you know, LLMs are cool. Yeah, uh, you know, OpenAI has done an amazing job of really getting everybody access to AI technologies. But what's really cool is all the open source stuff that's happening. Um, you know, Langchain, um, all the vector stores, the really cool research going into embedding. Um, that stuff is really what's going to make the difference. And that's what we start to be able to implement AI in our operational side of running these infrastructures. Yeah. So, but then you're talking about uh, the impact of AI on on running your infrastructures and developing the, 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 the tools that you use to do that? That's one area of impact. Yeah. I think that's really an important area, especially for a lot of the community we're talking to. I think so too. I mean, that's the most important one. I mean, the, 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 the other side, I mean, and I, I think that's, it gets dilutes a little bit by all the focus on Gen AI, obviously, which is which is more of an assistant kind of thing, and it, 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 not not necessarily an assistant, but more summarizing a lot of stuff, and it helps you understand stuff better. You know that that that's more of the 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 final application that you put AI of Gen AI in, mm-hmm. and I I I think the more interesting cases are using AI to actually make better applications. Do you get what I'm? I get where you're going. I mean. I'd slightly disagree with you. I, I think the human machine interface component that AI brings is incredibly interesting because now, to use an overused term, we're kind of democratizing access to infrastructure. Uh-huh. Um, not just infrastructure, but into IT systems. When a normal non developer person can now start to create tools to interact with data in a way that's more natural for human beings. Yeah using voice and word and Mm -hmm. text, um, that becomes very, very interesting for accessibility. Now, I don't disagree with you that what the really cool engineering use cases very much are happening in how do we manage our infrastructure when it comes to using this new AI tools. Especially when we start looking at, just look at Kubernetes. We get 
thousands and thousands of random log messages. Many of the, what many people would look at as an error is just normal. It's the nature of Kubernetes. Yeah. But if I can start to log all those things, use these AI tools to find patterns in all of these things, now I can start to say, okay, I'm running an application. Um, I can identify and correlate those patterns across that application. That's going to be able to give me things like, mm -hmm. well, optimizations. You know, instead of random example, but instead of doing 20 calls to an API, I can do one. Yep. Um, I can see what happens when I do 20 calls across the system, mm -hmm. and that's really important. But I mean, that's also necessary, right? Because it makes things faster and more efficient, and that's always good. Yeah. If you, especially when we, it more efficient, yeah. lower latency. Yeah, especially when we're moving into an, an era where you need more and more to squeeze more and more out of your your resources anyway. So. But also an era where when you have front end applications and you have an audience that's expecting a certain level of performance, and you know you you, know, you click on a directory search and it takes twenty minutes to come up. Nobody wants that. No. Um, no. So if you can find ways to at least get the perceived experience of your application to be considerably faster um, and more responsive. Now you're changing your audience. Yeah. And in a, in a world where we are, you know, splitting hairs in many application spaces, that's really, really important. Yeah. yeah I, I agree with you. It's just, uh, how, how would you, use, how would you characterize where we are in this, in this, in, in, in this, in, on, on this trajectory? Depending on who you talk to, I mean, we're really at the top of the hype curve right now. Um, I think we're going to, we're going to run into some people are going to suddenly realize that this is just hype and that it's not really production ready in many use cases. There's going to be a lot of challenges there. Um, we're seeing some of those challenges. You know, everyone right now is very focused on the public API, chat GPTs and the like. Reality is not every company is going to be able to use or allowed to yeah. or allowed to. Yeah. Or want to take the risk. I mean, we're in Europe. We yeah. have we we have great privacy protections, you know, as residents of European countries. Um, but we expect the companies that have our data to take care of that data, and I don't want them. Frankly, I don't want them being pushed into open AI. No, no, I don't. I, I think that's a fair. Uh, <laughs> It's a fair desire, yeah. <laughs> not not to not to want that. I but mean, it might but, be too late. But <laughs> yeah, oh, well, for for some things it is. Uh, but yeah, but, the, but you, you see some interesting uh, initiatives coming up in, 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 in that respect, right? And, 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 and to be honest, most of the models, I think, from, from, what I, from, from where I'm standing, most of the models that you, most of the, the load is going to be on, on inferencing and, on, you know, all that, and that's going to be local anyway. Yeah. You know, you're not going to do that in the cloud. So it's, maybe, maybe you will, but I mean, but, but there, there, is, there is good, there are many good reasons to think of of doing it not in the cloud, and and it's possible oh, sure. at least. But with training, for example, that's just that's that, that's, that's just going to happen. In cloud. Yeah, that is virtually impossible. And I don't think it's going to be in your traditional cloud. I think we're going to start to see more and more, and we are. I mean, just look at look at what NVIDIA is doing. Look at what the big cloud providers are doing. More and more really specialized training that are going to differentiate based on how fast you can train on those infrastructures. Yeah. Um, but I agree with you. Inference is going to be done. Local, and I say that in inverted commas, because it might be running on a GPU provided by a hyperscaler. Yeah, you can also you can always have the local cloud but or it, whatever. Yeah, but it won't be utilizing a inference service from those. No, you know, with their models behind yeah, it, won't be allowed to. It won't be allowed to. No. Um, but the, is is AI also the primary kind of challenge or the, the thing for the community itself to actually? tackle at the moment or are there other things that you see happening that are maybe even more important or mm -hmm. or slightly overlooked maybe yeah i mean look from a community right now kubernetes is still hard we still don't have standards around things like serverless containers you know we we have every hyperscaler every vendor has their own serverless container model what that means is in a world again in europe where we're having to deal with registration like dora where portability is really important it's just one example. Yeah, um, we need to find a way to create common standards, and our community has a habit of repeating itself mm -hmm. um, and not sticking to standards and recreating the wheel. And if we can find better ways within the community to prevent that from happening, that'll go a long way to people trusting open source even more than they do today. Yeah, um, and at the end of the day, 
you know, the commercialization of, of open source is all about trust. Yeah. It's about creating trust. Yeah. Um, so there's also this thing going on at the moment called uh, the platform engineering, right? That's yeah. A, that's a big topic as well. I always smile when people talk to me about it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad I made you smile. But um, uh, there's a lot of, um, maybe even also hype again on uh, around mm-hmm. it, but, but uh, some of it, is, I think, is... is Makes sense, absolutely right. I mean, especially when you you refer to it earlier as it is Kubernetes is still very complex. So if you can somehow move into some sort of a platform engineering approach that would make it less complex, at least. I mean, not not the foundations, but you don't need to worry about that. You need to worry about that. Yeah, that, that's the point, right? I mean, absolutely. I I think what we have to be careful of is over defining a platform that doesn't meet the needs of an organization. And what, what is a platform at the end of the day? It, it's a set of tools necessary to run my applications and my applications, so my unique applications, in a production environment consistently. Yeah. Because Kubernetes on its own is just an orchestration layer. And you know, to all the Kubernetes people out there, don't shoot me for saying that. Yeah. But ultimately, what makes it truly valuable is what I can add on to it. Um, to support my application and to accelerate the development of applications. But there's another side of it which is important when we talk platform, and that's providing guardrails to developers. Mm -hmm. It's providing developers, helping them abstract the complexity and provide them the security standards, the rules, and the tools so that they don't have to go and reinvent the wheel every time they're doing something. That is what a platform is to me. Yeah. But we need composable platforms to achieve those goals. Yeah, yeah. Somebody came in, but yeah, <laughs> and we just wanted to wait until uh, he slammed the door. Slam but, the door, but he didn't. So we, we could have just gone on. But no, no, oh, it's fine. <laughs> no, so 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 but platform engineering is real, right? I mean, it is, and and it and it makes sense. Um, but what does it say? What does it do for the maturity of um, Kubernetes in general? Right, because that there's a big. I mean, yesterday during the keynote, there was this. Uh, Linux moment. People are talking about Kubernetes reaching its Linux moment and and being being at a point where it was relatively mature after ten years. I think Kubernetes itself, yes, certainly. Um, I think the delivery of platforms on top of Kubernetes in a consistent way is not there. No. Um, there are too many different options. There's no consistent standard. Look, Helm's great, but great in one cluster. Yeah. Um, you're still composing things with Helm. Um, it's still highly complicated. Um, is the Linux moment there quite... I don't know. I wouldn't think it's we, we've quite hit the full Linux moment where it's ubiquitous and, and standard. That said, Linux isn't particularly easy to use either. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I've been working with it for probably 30 years and I still don't find it particularly easy. No, um, no that's true. But yeah, maybe I'm just not smart enough. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, if, if, if well, you became CTO, so I would hope you 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 are <laughs> smart. <laughs> you're just smart enough to be able to use it. <laughs> Promote you to a level of incompetence. Yeah, well, it's the Peter Principle or whatever, whatever it's called. Yeah. So, um, but from from a standpoint, from from your standpoint, right? For, for from the from Mirantis as a company, what does it mean um, that we're moving? Albeit maybe slowly, into a platform engineering kind of kind of world. It does it does it impact your, not necessarily your business, but your your customers? Uh, how, how does it impact? It certainly your... impacts our customers. I mean, which is our business at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, they, there's there's not a big separation <laughs> between those two things. Um, yeah. You know, we're in the business of supporting enterprises to reach their goals. Um, I know it sounds a very vague thing for a CTO to say, but at the end of the day. What is our job? We have to make it easy for customers to produce valuable code that that's for their business. So the whole platform engineering approach right now, you know, we take the approach, we're going to put Kubernetes everywhere and create a, a baseline fabric. But that's just a starting point. You know, as I said earlier, Kubernetes on its own doesn't really give you much. Mm-hmm. So what platform engineering and the platform engineering approach means is that the audience I'm talking to when I'm delivering my product is the platform engineering teams. Yeah. I don't need to go and create a one fits everybody or one size fits nobody, you know, in socks. Yeah. Um, 
approach because those platform teams are going to take responsibility for composing the components they need to service their audience. Yeah. What I need to do as a business is give them the tools to make that easy, consistent. And again, I'll come back to this term safe. Ultimately, they need to know that somebody's got their back. I'm doing it with open source. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel anywhere, but I'm trying to give them that that safety net that they can come in and deliver on. Yeah. yeah I know we've talked about this before and on, on, on different occasions, not not necessarily today but or, or on, on this podcast, but uh, th- there is this thing. I mean, when you start thinking like this for customers, right, and giving them a platform that's safe and, you know, all that, all, all those all those components that you you get into sort of an opinionated kind of mm. kind of stack, which is I mean, I'm I'm all for it, but uh, because I think that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. But w- w- where do you see the balance in in this yeah. opinionation? What, what, what's so I think it's fine to be opinionated. Um, no. I think you need to be you need to understand who your audience is. Who are you talking to, and who are you providing capabilities to? We're trying to walk the line between being fully opinionated and composable. Um, and the way we do that is by really focusing on a truly curated set of mature projects within within the community. Where we need to, we're going to really heavily contribute back to those projects to help them with that maturity and that standardization. Provide solutions. So lifecycle management is really where our core skills are. Mm-hmm. So provide lifecycle management solutions that allows platform teams to compose what they need out of that curated set help them work out how to curate the extra pieces and then do it for a small number of unique organizations out there. I'm I'm not going to try and create a one-size-fits-all. No, I'm going to try and create a better thing that allows my platform platform operations team to create what they need. Yeah. So my opinions are inserted into the lifecycle management tool set. Mm -hmm. My opinions are inserted into what I think is mature in the industry and maturity is everything about how big is the community how many code check-ins have they been on are they meeting the use case and those are the things that i count that i think count yeah but that's i mean i think that that makes that makes perfect sense and and but how does that what does it mean for your target audience in terms of the companies that you target is this is this approach suitable for everyone i mean i'm just trying to yeah you know we see the world that there's a subset of customers out there who want to have control of their digital de- digital yeah. excuse me digital destiny falling oh. over my own tongue here. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's it's almost five. So. Yeah, it's been a long day. Yeah. Uh, but w- there's a there's a subset of organisations in the world that really want to focus on being in control of how they build their infrastructure going forward. Mm-hmm. And I'm by infrastructure, I'm using it very broadly here, and. They don't want to be locked into a certain vendor. Um, we see that with some of the changes happening in the industry today. You know, suddenly people are being being told, "Well, I'm increasing your price, 10x." So VMware, for example, VMware, for yeah. example, the Broadcom components, yeah. or you know, they're end of lifeing a product, but not really end of lifeing a product. So, how do we give customers the optionality not to be locked into that type of model, yet still give that safety and support? And and that's where we see our seeds. Those customers who recognize that they need control of their destiny are yeah. willing to take control of their destiny. And that's a it's a sig- small but significant subset of organizations in the world. And we, we have a, quite a lot of those in our customer base yeah. today. D- d- going back to the um, to the to, to, to reconsidering after a sort of a 10x increase of, uh, of, of, of licensing, do you see a lot of VM replacement nowadays? I mean, pro- probably, probably for your customers, yes. Certainly for but, our customers, but, yeah. but the, the, there's also a big chunk of customers that are wall-to-wall VMware. They're probably not going to do this anytime soon, right? I think I think the VMware world can be separated into a num- number of different buckets. I mean, you've got the big, large-scale VMware customers who are using all the cloud capabilities and functionality of VMware. They're a very particular type of customer. Actually, they're quite forward-leaning in many ways because they've mm-hmm. taken advantage of these cloud capabilities. I don't see them shifting anytime soon. But in between them and the very small customers, there are enough customers there who are looking for, if not alternatives to VMware, complements to VMware. Mm -hmm. They want to move a significant portion of workload to another vendor or another platform 
um, that can give them negotiating power and optionality and that ability to say, hey, I've still got certain workloads on VMware because they're certified there, they work there, the vendors support them there, and it's great. VMware does very well and has done very well. Fantastic, fantastic technologies. Yeah. Um, but there are enough workloads out there that don't need VMware underneath the hood. So that's one approach, yeah. you know, VM to VM. Yeah. But I think the biggest opportunity right now is a modernization opportunity. And if we can find ways to work with customers to do a net zero or largely net zero migration so they can keep their costs flat over time or maybe some minor bumps here and there, we've got mm -hmm. to keep that careful, but take those VMs and get them into containers now we're changing the ecosystem. Yeah, and they, and, but they still use VMs. They still use VMs. But it, it's on a different different platform. That, that's one. Yeah. Or we actually take those VMs and get them into containers. Actually modernize those. They, they, yeah. But, uh, and d does it work to have your VMs in containers? Because back in the day, a long time ago, when cl cloud came up, they said, well, lift and shift. You don't do that. Is there a similar argument to be made for VMs in, 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 in containers of it, or is it a different discussion? It's a slightly different discussion. It's not the, look, many people lift and shifted into cloud. Yeah. Um, and they were not happy. And they were not happy. They've been burnt. It cost them four times as much because they didn't change to cloud patterns. Yeah. You can make the same mistake with VMs to containers, and many will. But the reality is, if you're careful and you're smart about analyzing the type of application that's running, and you do that shift from that application into a container in a, in a controlled way, and you pick the right workloads, and there are enough of them out there, then you can do a straight migration. Many applications are going to need to be refactored. No. It's just reality. So you have to then do a cost analysis. Is it worth my while refactoring, or do I just continue to run them in VMs? Because it ain't broke. No. It works. No. The, the real question, though, comes is as you look at the curve of what's it going to cost you to maintain the legacy over time. We all know that legacy costs go up. Yeah, that. And I would imagine you would also like to accelerate your own development and your own um, company's development. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it, 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 your own company's it, value it, in it. Yeah. In its IT. So why do we? Then all this legacy may, yeah, well, th th that's gonna gonna hamper you. Yeah, in, in, at least in the, in, in, in the future, if not already now. Um. So, th but it, that's this is a hard decision to make, I would imagine. For... It is a hard decision to make, but I mean, we we're there are great tools becoming available on the market. There are great small companies that can come in and help you do that analysis. But it is it's it it's an analysis of cost mm -hmm. versus value to your business versus, you know, are you just putting a Band-Aid over it and long-term you're going to have to excise the wound? Um, you have to make that decision then. Yeah. It's, it's one that needs to be done. Yeah. Um, I know, as we've been talking about the future, how, how do you see, see the future? Take out your crystal ball and, mm -hmm. and look, look a year or two and sort of the next cube calls here in Europe. Uh, so look, the... The crystal ball gazing is always a tough one. Well, oh, that's why it's so hard. So, yeah. so, 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 so nice if you can do it. I think more and more we're going to start to see consolidation. Um, you know, still, if I go and walk the floor, there are so many different networking options, so many different security options, but we're slowly seeing that consolidation start to happen. So from an industry point of view, I think Kubernetes is going to get more stable, more more. There'll be fewer people doing large-scale multi-cluster deployments. There'll be some winners there, simple. Uh -huh. There'll be some consolidation there. Networking side of things, there's always cool new little networking companies starting up, but I'm going to think what we're going to see is we're going to see more standardization there. Bluntly, Crystal Ball, multi-cloud is going to be the norm going forward. It won't be what it is today where it's only the cool, the cool kids are doing it. No. It's just going to be normal. Is Kubernetes ready for that? Kubernetes itself, yes. yes. We've but, got to kind of get out but, of our own way in that case. But then, then we then we get to the previous discussion again. Yes. It, itself, yes, but all the stuff, the ecosystem uh, around it is yeah. not quite ready for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure that the users are ready for the complexity yet. Yeah. Um, but it's the same way, you know, 
30 years ago, Linux was complicated and this beast. Linux hasn't changed that much, but we've learned, we've grown. Well, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, you grow together yeah. with, with the technology. With technology and it starts to get less complicated and more standardized yeah. and more supportable and you know, dealing less with bugs and more with trying to create. So, so that's definitely an area I would say is the future. You know, this idea of Kubernetes as a fabric across everything. Yeah. Um, we're going to see more alternate technologies, and we've all spoken about WASM to at length. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny, by the way. I haven't heard many people talk about this. Not yet, yeah, but ubiquitous computers is going to be a real thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I still feel strongly that we're going to see more mobile devices with more ubiquitous compute type capabilities, um, with you know, GPUs on the edge providing for a lot of everyday services. Um, we've been talking about it for 10 years, you know, all okay. the, the 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G in the telco industries and, and on, we're actually at a point now where it's possible and could become. Well, it's about time then. Yeah. <laughs> Not the 10 so years, but. Is the investment there and, and uh, what is the killer application for those things? Yeah. Uh, that's really it. And of course, you know, we're going to, I believe strongly, we're going to see a bit of a slump in the AI hype. But then so. in the next two two to three years, AI will just become new. I, 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 I had the same impression. I was recently was at an, an event by HP and they were talking about their AI PCs, you know, mm -hmm. that stuff. But I have, I have talked about AI at the edge. And I was like, oh, okay, but I mean, and they were saying a five-year-old, uh, five-year-old, uh, there are 10 million five-year-old or older devices out there that can be replaced. That doesn't mean that, that there's no reason. The reason they, they replace it with an AI PC is not because they, there's AI in that PC, it's just because it's the next generation. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it becomes, it becomes interesting from, 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 from that perspective if they've changed after two years. So, oh, mm -hmm. I want this AI PC. And I don't see that happening. And I, then I think that's, 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 I think what you're alluding to as well is it's just going to be the next step. Next level. And I think that, that goes it, back to... It'll just be part of everyday life. It'll be within everything. Um, yeah. You know, our phones, my my phone can run AI right now. Yeah. Yes, particularly fast. But it's there. Oh. But the reality is a lot of that stuff is going to be run through API services on a back end. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. frankly, we have the connectivity for it. We don't need to run everything. Oh. But the user interface and the processing, if we could start to push it down to the edge, the real impact of doing that sustainability i think yeah and if i'm not running everything in big fat data centers everywhere and i can run it on the edge devices and and push that you know heating cooling etc requirements to somewhere yeah. else i change a lot yeah even even if ai is just another workload even if ai is just another <laughs> workload and i mean i strongly believe it is the yeah. inference side of it and the gpu side of it is we're going to see a big change in that world yeah um, yeah. yeah and it becomes a scale step change but yeah. So we ended up with AI again. Yeah. So even though we were, we said we would, we weren't we going, going to talk. We weren't going to talk about it, and we, we talked about it for, a, for for I think for about ten, fifteen minutes of the of the thirty minutes that we uh, that we had. But uh, I think it's a good good point to um, to close. Uh, Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, for for talking to me, and um, well, I look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Tech Scene Talks on Tour. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. If you'd like more information, please feel free to visit techzine.eu, where we cover everything, everywhere. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll join us again on the next episode of Tech Scene Talks on Tour.